Okay, so maybe this wasn't my best idea. In the last video, I made the terrible mistake of challenging myself to play and review every NFT and crypto game on the Epic Game Store, and so far, they've been, well, pretty bad, to say the least. But I've got a long journey ahead of me, and Epic keeps adding more fuel to this dumpster fire every month. So, I gotta get started while I still have a little bit of self-respect remaining. <sighs> Cue the intro. Collect. Build. Fight. Join us in Rainy the Lords of Light, the tactical trading card game in battle to be the greatest hero, building decks full of powerful spells and loyal minions in a battle for domination of the Rainyverse, a true TCG for card game enthusiasts new and old. These crypto game developers gotta work on writing better descriptions, this reads terribly. The first thing that we see in the trailer for this game is a card that features Elon Musk with laser eyes dual wielding rocket launchers. I can already tell that this game is gonna be great. Judging by the rest of the trailer and the screenshots, this appears to be yet another Hearthstone clone. But does Hearthstone have Elon Musk as a playable card? Yeah, I didn't think so. Welcome to Rainy, the Lords of Light. Would you like to learn how to play the game? No. The tutorial battle involves me playing as vaguely Nikola Tesla versus a definitely not AI generated woman with horns. Yeah, like I said, this is just Hearthstone, except with a new feature, staking a card. For those of you fortunate enough to not understand crypto lingo, staking is a way to gain a return on investment by locking your coins up for a fixed amount of time. But in this video game, staking a card just means that you sacrifice it in exchange for a mana gem and a card draw. Other than staking, the only other gameplay difference from Hearthstone is that your mana gems are colored and different cards require different colored mana gems to summon. While continuing through this tutorial, I couldn't help but notice the environment around the board. On the left, we have a beautiful, thriving forest, emblematic of a world free of the excess carbon pollution and e-waste that a global cryptocurrency economy would inevitably lead us toward. And on the right, we have a nuclear cooling tower with the Bitcoin logo on it next to a factory or a refinery of some sort. This must represent the computing power and emissions footprint required to process three blockchain transactions. And above that, a vaguely futuristic and, of course, purple building. This represents the capitalist oligarchy that crypto bros dream of being in charge of, hence their relentless worship of billionaires like this game's very mascot, Elon Musk. Anyway, I'm supposed to be playing the game, right? The rest of the tutorial plays out exactly like a typical game of Hearthstone, so I didn't really need to pay attention to any of these instructions. I gotta say, this game is far more polished than Gods Unchained, which is sad. Gods Unchained was one of the very first crypto games that I reviewed on this channel, and one of my biggest complaints at the time was that the game felt lazy and unpolished, despite having been in development for half a decade. Rainy, the game you're watching me play right now, was announced in 2021, and it just fully released a few months ago. Now, that's a far more reasonable development timeline for a game of this scale, so credit given where it's due. Now that I've completed the tutorial, I'm ready to jump directly into a ranked match. After about a two minute wait, I load into a battle against my first real player opponent. The starter cards are all generic robots, which don't follow the game's crypto theme. The different color tribes all feature these exact same robot starter cards, except they're palette swapped and have different backgrounds. The match was going smoothly, and I was actually winning until the opponent summoned a card called Professor Cohen, which gave all of his minions a force field. I think that this is supposed to be Tyler Cohen, a libertarian economist and proponent of cryptocurrency, but I'm not sure, because it doesn't really look like him. But just as I had amassed a small force of robots, I was stopped dead in my tracks when my opponent played the powerful trap card, Gary Gensler, chair of the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, it's pretty obvious that this game has a strong pro-crypto narrative, and they certainly aren't afraid to shove it down your throat. Some of my favorite cards from the game include Blaze Dog, a bootleg Snoop Dogg that deals 420 Venom damage. SBF, a card that depicts Sam Bankman-Fried, a man who is currently awaiting trial for running a multi-billion dollar fraudulent crypto exchange. Rugzilla, a card that has famed YouTuber and crypto scam exposer CoffeeZilla piloting a giant mech. And last but not least, the Quantum Rug, which destroys all other minions on the board. You can literally rug pull the enemy. While these are sort of funny from an ironic point of view, I'm pretty sure that these are all serious. Which just makes this whole thing cringe. 
Also, I highly doubt that any of these people gave permission for this game to use their likeness, especially since the developers are technically making a profit off of their image. Part of me was expecting to find an Andrew Tate card somewhere in this pile of Crypto Bro idols, but there wasn't one. In general, the card artwork isn't really half bad, but the strange mixture of fantasy creatures and real-life public figures is kind of creepy. I played one more match of Rainy, which I lost before I got bored. Time to check out the game's microtransaction store, because that's the whole purpose of a crypto game. Well, it doesn't seem to be directly integrated with the blockchain in any way. In fact, you can't even purchase card packs in-game using crypto, only with a credit card or PayPal. The only thing explicitly crypto that I could find in-game was an advertisement for an upcoming tournament where you can win $50 of Avalanche tokens. I did a deep dive on the game's website to see if there was maybe a hidden crypto payment option, but all I could find were these collector's edition card packs. These cost 0.1 Ethereum or $185 each and include three cards. Amazing. In conclusion, Rainy, the Lords of Light is a surprisingly competent Hearthstone dupe with an in-your-face libertarian pro-crypto theme. The gameplay is polished, it runs smoothly, and the artwork isn't half bad. However, if you don't have .eth at the end of all of your social media handles and an NFT profile picture, I have no idea why you would ever download this game. It's a funny novelty for a few minutes if your entire personality revolves around crypto, but I don't know why a normal person would spend money on this game. So I'll give Rainy the Lords of Light a score of Crypto Cringe out of 10. Apiron is a roguelite x god game hybrid, a revival of the classic god simulation genre popular in the early 2000s. Players are able to play god by growing their own planets and controlling giant avatars in battle. Apiron is an ancient Greek word meaning that which is unlimited, boundless, infinite, or indefinite. A pretty sick name for a game if you ask me, but I definitely thought it was pronounced ape iron at first. After launching the game and agreeing to the terms and conditions that I definitely read, I am presented with three options, logging in with my email, my MetaMask wallet, or playing as a guest. After creating my account, I get to watch this rather compressed and extremely loud cutscene. The way that the subtitle text is translated from this made-up language is a pretty cool detail. In fact, this game has insane levels of polish for a crypto game. This intro cutscene has more effort put into it than most crypto games in their entirety. After the intro ends, we begin the tutorial, which is a generous way of describing whatever this is. The only explicit instructions given are the movement controls. The actual mechanics of the game are instead left for you to figure out on your own. In short, you control your god character and can move them around using the WASD keys. The character automatically attacks every few seconds, so you only need to worry about getting in range to attack and then dodging when the enemies attack you. Over time, you gain energy, shown on the right side of the screen. You can then click and drag the cards from your deck to spend the energy and cast a spell. It's pretty clear that this was originally supposed to be a mobile game, but for whatever reason, the developers settled on making it a PC exclusive. This concept of making a mobile game and then porting it to PC is actually a common trend in crypto gaming from the games that I've played in the past, and it kind of makes sense when you consider the predatory microtransactions that both crypto games and mobile games share. But despite Apiron being essentially a mobile game, it has some severe performance issues. All of the game shaders are compiled at runtime, and it causes the game to stutter and freeze constantly whenever you cast a new spell. Now, this stuttering calmed down after about a half hour of playing, but it really hindered my first impressions of the game. After defeating the tutorial enemy, I gained a few rewards, some currency, and an apostle. Then, I'm taken to a branching path where I can choose my next battle similar to other roguelike games like FTL or Slay the Spire. In this battle, I'm given the ability to select apostles to fight by my side. The apostles are basically my AI party members. They're controlled by the computer and they can assist me in various ways. You can choose up to four apostles to fight alongside you in a battle. The different types include tanks, healers, range damage, etc. Each one has a different set of cards that are then added to your deck when they're in your party, which give your team additional skills to use in battle. 
So far, besides the insufferable stuttering, Apiron is actually a fun and unique game. However, it would be far better suited as a mobile game, as the UI, controls, and really the entire gameplay concept is clearly designed to be played on a phone instead of a desktop PC. Because of this, I decided to do a little bit more research and see if perhaps there's a mobile version that I'm missing. On the game's website, they have a white paper which outlines the core plans behind Apiron. This explains that the game was developed by a team with a history in mobile game development, and that the original plan for Apiron was for it to be a mobile game, but eventually the scope and size of the game grew too far, and they had to port it to desktop. Also on the game's website, I found this interesting tidbit where the developers proudly state that they plan on using AI to create the artwork for the game. But don't worry, the AI models are trained only using assets that they own the IP to. If this is true, then I think that this is actually a good example of how AI can be used to help small game development teams work faster and create a game that would otherwise be out of scope. Plus, at least they're honest about using AI, unlike some people. Returning to the game, I continued playing through a few more battles, gaining more apostles, currency, and upgrades after each round. Similar to the other roguelites that I mentioned earlier, there's a variety of different events that you can encounter along this branching path. Events with multiple choices, campfires, shops, upgrade stations, and so on. But this is the standard roguelite formula at this point, so nothing new or surprising. After completing a bunch of battles and reaching the end of the path, I'm eventually faced with the game's first boss. So far, every battle has been straightforward and very easy. I was mostly just casting spells at complete random. The boss, however, required me to change my strategy and think more carefully about the spells that I cast. Additionally, I had to dodge and position my guide character so that I didn't take unnecessary damage. After getting the boss down to half health, he flees, ending the battle, and leaving us with a cliffhanger. The boss gets away, and now I have to go into another dungeon and track them down. While I could definitely keep playing and see what happens next, I think I've got the gist of it. Besides, I still have to go into the crypto and NFT implementations for Apiron. Which makes me wonder, how exactly would an NFT or crypto fit into this type of game? This is a roguelite, isn't it supposed to be skill-based and randomly generated? Well, let's find out. Heading to the Apiron website allows us to access the game's NFT marketplace. Here, you can purchase planets, which allow you to play as different gods in-game. These gods all sell for between $50 to $200 each, depending on the quality of the planet. Quoting the game's white paper, these planets are where the main gameplay loop happens, and they're necessary to play Apiron, essentially functioning as a player's license to play. Players have two options to acquire their first planet NFT. They may join a gaming guild to get a non-transferable seed planet to try the game for free, or they can purchase one available on the marketplace. So it's kind of like Axie Infinity, where you can either become a scholar or buy one of your own. Once the full game is released, you'll be required to buy or borrow one of these planets, but right now you can play it for free since the game isn't fully released. Although, even though the game's not fully released, of course, you can still buy NFTs because those are always for sale. But it seems like there really aren't a whole lot of people buying and selling these planets because there hasn't been a sale in almost two weeks. Other than planets, you can also buy stronger apostles that you can use in the roguelike game. And what would an NFT game be without a way to purchase virtual land? Yay! Apiron is of course no exception, and you can purchase land in the form of a star. These cost well over $1,000 a piece, and the last time someone purchased one was a month ago, and before that, nobody had purchased one for 5 months. All things considered, the inclusion of NFTs in Apiron just really seems like a way to justify predatory monetization practices. The game is a rather simple phone game, you really shouldn't need to pay $50 to get access to it. And besides, it's not really that fun if all the strong gods are locked behind a rare planet NFT that costs hundreds of dollars. Oh, and I almost forgot, there's also a battle pass. It looks like you pay for it by the hour by purchasing NFTs that cost $2, so about $2 an hour, not including transaction fees. While this battle pass is active, you get a bonus called Booty Hour, which causes NFT apostles to drop as rewards during gameplay and gives you one free revive per game run. Kinda sounds like pay to win, no? So, not only does Apiron have overpriced microtransactions, it also is just wasting real-world energy. 
Yes, I know all about Ethereum's move to proof of stake, and I know that it uses less energy than it used to. But a blockchain, at the end of the day, will still consume far more energy per transaction than a traditional centralized database. And when we're looking at a video game that's entirely centralized by nature, it brings the question of, why are we wasting all of this energy? It really just seems like a whole lot of unnecessary expenditure for no real benefit. So, at least in a Puron's case, the use of cryptocurrency and NFTs really doesn't make any sense. It's just overcomplicating things for the sake of getting that sweet, sweet crypto money. But despite all of this, a Puron still surprised me. The game is pretty polished for being in early development, and it has a unique art style and some cute characters, but it's just not something that I would see myself playing again, and that's a shame because I really do love roguelites. The game loop is oversimplified and bogged down by a litany of items purchasable with real money. The UI and gameplay were clearly designed for a mobile device, but the game is a PC exclusive. And once the game leaves beta and you're required to own the NFT to play it, it'll be a hassle and cost 50 bucks to play. In my opinion, Apiron just falls into the bucket of NFT games that make me sad. What could have been a great and innovative indie title is instead marred by the unintuitive and obstructive bloat of cryptocurrency, all for the sake of trying to get an extra buck out of the consumer. Because of these reasons, I decided to give Apiron a score of ruined by NFTs out of 10. All right, you guys know I had to save the best for last. Diverse world. Oh my god, another metaverse? Wasn't the whole point of the metaverse to be that it was just one interconnected world? Now there's like 50 of them, and none of them are cross-compatible. And as far as I've seen, they're all just terrible versions of Second Life, and that's being generous. You'd be surprised to find a single other person online in most of these games. But with a description like this, how could anyone pass on Diverse world? An open sandbox metaverse, we enables everyone to be a creator, a contributor the seamless and open metaverse. With a modular approach, creators share unique experiences, fostering a culture of creativity and collaboration through shared templates within the community. This is going to be great. Select your presence. We haven't even made it one sentence into the game before finding an egregious spelling mistake. This is not a good sign. I signed in with my Epic Games account and was brought to the character creator. Is it just me or does this guy look vaguely like Elon Musk? Or is this just Elon Musk? I can't escape this guy. On the main menu, we have four options to choose from. Exploration, World Builder, Customization, and Inventory. I'll start with Exploration, and we'll see if I even make it to the others. After unblocking the game and having it freeze for about 10 seconds, I'm finally in the long-awaited Diverse Metaverse. This is breathtaking. My first quest is to collect 20 coins, which, as we learned from playing The Sandbox, is the most common form of gameplay in the Metaverse. Jeez, this is one hell of a walk cycle. Hello? Sir? Are you okay? There's a bunch of NPCs scattered all around the world, and speaking to them treats us to some goofy dialogue. There are, surprisingly, other players here, but at no point did I see any of them move an inch. They all seem to be AFK. I then headed towards the central building of the city and tried to use the elevator. However, upon using it, my character just phases out of existence and then reappears without having ascended. Considering that it looks like there's some coins on top of the building, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to complete this quest. But just a few seconds later, I was notified that another player joined the server. I put on my friendly face and sent them a kind message in chat. Nobody responded. I then proceeded to run up a very steep hill. Look at him go! Whoa! That looks painful. There were more dancing NPCs and coins at the top of this hill, but everything about this metaverse just feels lifeless. At least this one has online capabilities though, as when I first played The Sandbox, that game didn't even have multiplayer. But a social game is utterly pointless without anyone else to socialize with, and so I opened the map and traveled to the medieval world in my continued search for some virtual companionship. After loading into the medieval village that is definitely not just a pre-made asset, I ran into a player in a suit with a space helmet named Stadazdazd. In an attempt to get Stadazdazd's attention, I began throwing punches like my life depended on it. While this caused him to spurt out green blood, it ultimately had no effect towards garnering his attention. 
Heading outside, I pass by even more players in identical outfits standing completely still. This is all quite surreal. It reminds me of a scene you might find in a Rene Magritte painting. Ever since I joined this world, I had this message on the corner of my screen showing my quest. Slay 9,999,990 goblins and 999,999 tree ants. But judging by the current progress, it looks like this is a community quest, and not much progress has been made. But there's no goblins anywhere to be found. I even checked out the inside of this cave, and as everyone knows, goblins love caves. But nope, nothing. Doubling back towards the village, I notice a beautiful sea in the distance. But just as I approach the shoreline, a sign catches my eye. The message? Attention please. We do not have swim yet. I bravely step over the edge of the dock to see what happens, only to find that I am blessed with the powers of water walking. Channeling my inner Jesus, I run down the river and return to the village that I spawned in. While there are a few NPCs here, not all of them can be interacted with, and most of them appear to have no animations at all. They're just rigid models plopped in the map. This police officer is especially unsettling. Just enjoying some fresh air. Man, if that's what enjoying looks like, I'd hate to see displeasure. Continuing on, I enter a nearby building and gain my very first achievement. Tireless Explorer. Inside this hut, there's a few soldiers sleeping in beds, snoring. There's also two other players in the building, keeping a close watch over the sleeping soldiers, while, as usual, remaining entirely still. I gotta say, D-verse world has certainly been one of the most surprising metaverses I've played thus far. Not because it's good or anything, just because it's very strange. There's basically nothing to do, and the two quests that I did find seem to be uncompletable. But there's still one more world that I haven't tried yet. The Void. Well, it was called the void after all. I'm now stuck in the endless void of space, and I can't interact or move or do anything. All I can do is just spin the camera and stare into vast nothingness. So that was most of the stuff to see in d World. There's the map editor and a character creator, but I doubt any of those are good, so I'll just skip them. Actually, you know what? On second thought, let's look at that character creator real quick. There's only a few models to choose from. There's a spaceman and a, a muscle cat. What? I can also change my race, but that doesn't do anything or give me any additional models to choose from. Yeah, so that's enough of Dverse World. Why do I always feel like these games are just crypto miners sloppily disguised under the guise of a game? Hmm, I have no idea. Well, I've got no choice but to give Dverse World a score of, it's a, it's a metaverse, out of 10. It's hard to believe that just two weeks ago, I was celebrating hitting 4,000 subscribers. I guess the algorithm picked up my channel because we've more than doubled that in just a week. So to all my new subscribers, welcome aboard, and I'm happy that you found my videos enjoyable. Now that I've passed the 10,000 subscriber mark, I've been getting all sorts of mails from sponsors such as Raid Shadow Legends or Generic VPN, offering me hundreds of dollars to shill their garbage products to my audience. I always said that I would never sell out, and I'll never take a sponsor for any of my videos. However, that doesn't mean that I won't happily accept donations from my fans. So if that's something you're interested in, you can buy me a coffee using the link in the pinned comment. Anyway, now that I'm done with my weekly dose of crappy crypto games, I might finally have some time to sit down and finish Remnant 2. I'll see you in the next episode, where I try my best to not die of boredom while playing a $3 million Fortnite asset flip with zero online players. Alright, that's all. Goodbye.